Good evening. So please don't take that I'm leaving right after this as any sign that I hate Chattanooga. Um, fall conference season is rough. This is my eighth straight week of travel. Um, but I'm excited to be here. It's my first time in Chattanooga, but not my last. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to talk about these issues because it sounds, you know, I like going to lots of different cities and one of the things that I find is many of the issues that I talk about in one city are things that are happening in another city. And so I think only by like actually surfacing it and having these conversations about the hard topics that are keeping our cities from being what we actually hope that they could be is how we actually start to move forward. Uh, so. One of the things that I'll do out of the talk today is really talking about this process that I've been going through in my own head as I look through my work, um, about what it means to start to design with intention and, and how do we bring that to any projects um, or any initiative or any program that we might be doing. And for me, a lot of that is like really holding space for what my role is, and I would actually argue if this talk seemed interesting enough for you to show up to, it's probably your role as well, that in some ways we are caretakers of the built environment. And I use the word caretaker very intentionally because I think caretaker suggests a certain amount of responsibility, and not just a responsibility for the physical pieces, but for all the life that happens within it, whether it be people life or natural life. And so. I want that to be a little bit of the lens of how we talk about stuff in this talk and in conversations that it might engender is what would it mean if we were to show up as better caretakers for the places that we're operating within. Um, before I start, there's a, a thing that I do at the start of all of my lectures, and I was joking with folks earlier, um, there was, I did a workshop for some folks this afternoon, and I said, you know, I'm from California, so I tend to do a lot of woo-woo things. Um, and I'm going to do that now and ask for your indulgence. And uh, it's partly just to do a little level setting so that we can all enter this conversation in the same way. So to do it, I'm actually going to ask for you to close your eyes and try not to fall asleep when you do that. Um, and now that you have your eyes closed, I would like for you to take a deep breath in through your nose and then out through your mouth. One more time, in through your nose, and then out through your mouth. Now keep your eyes closed, and I would like for you to think about your favorite place. It could be a place that's from your childhood, or a place that you love to go to now, or even an imagined place you would love to have in the future. It could be a place that makes you feel happy, comfortable and relaxed, or just safe and loved. It might be a place in which you're by yourself, or perhaps there are other people there. Once you have the image of it, I want you to let it completely invade your senses. So think not only what it looks like, but also what it sounds like, what it feels like, even what it smells like. And I'd like you to hold that for a moment and then open your eyes. So Eric's introduction, I think, was actually quite appropriate um, because I talk about story a lot and the connection of story to place. And the reason why I have you do that exercise is that whether you realize it or not, that place that you thought of is a place that holds your story, or at least a piece of it. And it's a story that you have been adding to since the day you were born. Um, and even though we tend to think of our stories taking place so much in the digital sphere this day, these days, um, the truth of the matter is that regardless of what, whether we're texting, tweeting, posting, whatever, um, we're always surrounded by physical space. And that space exists as the armature for our stories. And so I introduce my talks like that because whenever the word architect comes up, people automatically want to ask me, well, what kinds of buildings do I design? And it's true that I design buildings, I design spaces, um, but the reality is that I prefer to see my calling as helping to shape the spaces that enable people to live their best stories. Um, now, I've been doing this work for almost 15 years, and in that time, I've come to realize that 
For those of us with privilege, whether it's education, access, class, race, et cetera, um, there's actually an abundance of places that help us do that. Um, from where we live, to where we play, sometimes even where we work. My work has actually been focused on communities for whom the opposite is true. Um, communities that are often surrounded by spaces that seldom support them to thrive, let alone survive. And so my work has actually been in like looking at what does it mean to engage those places and to create places that are honoring of the stories that exist there. Now, whether you realize it or not, you are actually familiar with these kinds of places as well, um, because we have catchphrases for it. So we might say the ghetto, wrong side of the tracks, or even food deserts. And what all of this is, is not just places that don't honor the stories of people who are living within it. This is actually what the lack of spatial justice looks like. So spatial justice is a term that was coined by geographers about five to 10 years ago. And it basically means that justice has a geography and that the equitable distribution of access, services, opportunities, and outcomes should be a basic human right. And the reality is that we don't have spatial justice in countless cities across the country when we can see conditions where there's differences in neighborhoods where industrial uses ended up and gleaming office towers didn't where insufficient bus routes occurred and multi-million dollar transit centers didn't, where vacant lots proliferated and nice parks didn't. And I can go to cities across the country and find these differences in conditions. And this is what the lack of spatial justice looks like. Now, you can't talk about injustice in space without talking about injustice across race and class. Because the truth of the matter is that black, brown, and poor communities have disproportionately had less access. And sadly, that often has been no accident. Now, I think it's important to hold all of this because as long as we continue to be separated and selectively harmed by space, we actually cannot heal the wounds of injustice or address any of the other just society aims that we have, whether it's racial justice, social justice, et cetera. And so in my work, I look at, well, how do we hold this? How do we actually move the needle on spatial justice so we can start to achieve some of the other just the same? So to share what this looks like in, project, in, um, in practice, um, I wanted to share a project that I've been working on for the last six years in San Francisco called Now Hunter's Point. Um, and Hunter's Point is a neighborhood in the southeastern quadrant of San Francisco. Um, it has been a historically working class African American neighborhood. And uh, it is also a perfect example of spatial injustice. So it has been home to much of the city's public housing, many of the city's industrial uses, um, including a power plant, which I'm going to sh show you in a second. And it also has been, um, currently, it's where you have the city's highest unemployment, um, one of the highest incarceration rates, and one of the highest poverty rates in San Francisco. Um, and to put the craziness of San Francisco in context for you, you might have heard that we have a little bit of a real estate issue. Um, so currently, the median home price in San Francisco is a little over $1.5 million. That's median. Um, the annual median income in this neighborhood is uh, $60,000. So how that works and what does that mean for this kind of neighborhood now that it has also become sort of ground zero for gentrification is a really interesting question. And so that's sort of what's come up in the context of the work that I'm doing. But to explain a little bit more about the neighborhood, I'm going to have residents from the neighborhood explain it. We have always been set aside like an island, a no man's island. We're right here in Baby Hunters Point, where the old power plant used to be. I'm something that I grew up with and going to reminisce about what this is all about, what Hunters Point is all about, and what the people was all about. What do you want for the future? What I want to see in the future is my 
grandchildren being productive citizens. I want them to go to school, to get educated, and to place themselves in the position so that they may help others. Joy is a result of having a strong sense of who you are, the direction you're going in life, and your overall purpose. By helping others, combining education and community service, communities are healed and streets are healed. If we think about our history and all we lost, we didn't lose it for nothing, you know, and all of what we do is not in vain. I'm proud to serve this community. I want to see the change, but I also want to see our culture preserved here and our families preserved here. We look out and we see just this space and the water comes up to the land and just makes me think of how important it is to preserve our beauty. I don't want to waste time wishing that I did something or said something. To wake up today and be alive and tell you I love you. This is a time for us to talk. And for us to be here today looking out on the outpost of the beginning of Hunter's Point. It's future. This is where the future is. And it will be a success story. So um, that uh, video comes from an oral history project that we did as part of this project. And oral histories are something that I incorporate in a lot of the projects that I do, because I think it's really important to understand the full history of the land, uh, because that often has everything to do with the context of how everyone is showing up to participate in processes around development. And without understanding that and without giving space to that, sometimes it's hard to have space to actually do the projects themselves. So as was indicated in the video, the, pro the site that we've been working on is an old power plant site. And this project has been going on for the last six years, but the history of this site goes much longer before that. So this power plant was up and running for almost a century. It was um, owned and operated by Pacific Gas and Electric who's in the news for other reasons these days. Um, but back in the 90s, a group of mothers who lived in the public housing that was located on this hill above the plant actually led a community coalition to fight for its closure. And they were actually successful. The PG&E closed the plant, tore it down, cleaned the soil, and then capped the soil with asphalt so that the clean soil would not blow away, which was kind of their standard practice for remediation efforts. Uh, the challenge was that because of various issues like land entitlements, lease agreements, et cetera, it was actually going to be at least a decade before any development could happen here. And actually right now we're already at that decade mark and it's very likely that we're going to see another 10 years before any development actually happens. The site itself is actually fairly large. So it's a 30 acre site. So we're talking 30 acres of asphalt or 30 football fields vacant for a decade. So to pg es credit, they actually realized that that would perhaps not be tenable in this neighborhood. And they wanted to actually figure out how could they start to do right and continue the process that they had already undertaken by closing the plant and cleaning the soil. And so they put out a call for design teams to propose temporary uses for the site. And I'm part of a trio of three firms that won that commission. And so for the past six years, We've been working with the utility company, local organizations, and residents to activate the site. And um, together, we've done everything from job training workshops, to yoga days, to even an annual circus. 
And the thing about these events is it's not just creating something that can be a community benefit and rather than blight. Um, it's not about doing activation for activation's sake, although that is an uh, activation and activating the site is important. But for us, these have also existed as sort of our community meetings to allow us to start to visualize what the future could potentially be, both by offering up events that recast the site that had formerly been forbidden and allowing people to see different potential realities for it, but also because, and I was joking with folks earlier today, that um, my clients often hate me because I refuse to hold community meetings, at least not in the beginning of the project. And that's often because I believe that community meetings tend to be transactional, and they tend to reward those who have time, and that in a lot of these neighborhoods, we're dealing with populations that are time poor. So these events, you may not want to go to a hall after you've finished your very, very long work shift, at the end of the day to talk about a project that may not see the light of day for another five years. But you actually probably want to bring your kid to the circus. And while you're there, we engage people in different conversations in which we're collecting data. Um, and things like the StoryCorps event where all of that was data, right? In the oral histories, we actually got people's stories that actually told us a lot about what was the history of the site, but also what were their hopes for the future. As you heard from the video, we didn't say what you want to see on the site. We just said, this is for you. Tell your story, however, part, whatever part you want of it. And out of that, we were able to decode a lot of the stuff that you see in the video. We also do a lot of stuff with um, youth. Um, because I believe that oftentimes children are a key constituent that we rarely have very specific things to engage them in. So actually finding out from them what they would like to see becomes an important part of understanding how the site. And this um, pertains to little kids as well. Um, so we have them kind of draw, becoming architects for the day and drawing their visions of the site. And no, no little kid's gonna say necessarily, I want to see X, Y, Z. In fact, um, I was joking with folks earlier that we had a kid who said he wanted to see a dinosaur park. I will not bring back the dinosaurs, as powerful as I am. Um, but when we compared a lot of the cards that we got, we had kids actually asking for things that meant um, how could they be interactive with nature. And that became part of the design principles for the, both the interim activation site, but also um, one of the first permanent things that has moved forward is the shoreline along our site um, had not yet been remediated. So we remediated it and we restored it to a higher level and basically turned it into a shoreline park. And all the activation work and the data that we have gotten out of the activation actually informed the design of the, the park um, in lots of different ways that if you really want to know, I can explain to you later. Um, but it also, you know, one of the things that we heard from people is really this idea of how do the stories not get lost? So one of the important things of this park is actually embedding some of those stories in the landscape. So this um, particular one actually tells the story of the power plant. Um, and not just the like, oh, hey, this community group was successful and they won and shouldn't we all feel happy about that, but actually the details of the struggle because what people felt is you're not telling the full story unless you tell both the good and the bad of the experience. Um, we also embedded um, in the landscape quotes from the StoryCorps recording and we didn't just do StoryCorps recordings with community members, we also did it with folks at pg e folks from the city and so the idea is like, who are all the stakeholders who sort of participated in what this land is, and how do we make sure that their voices are inscribed into the land? So, you know, in the, um, in the six years we've been operational, over 25,000 people have come to this site. Um, and for us, that's a great success, and a lot of people who've been involved in it, from community members to pg e to ourselves, feel great pride over what we've been able to accomplish, and that we get, you know, I could show you cute kid pictures all day long of, of stuff that's happened at our site. But I, I think the reality is, and oftentimes when we tell projects, we kind of stop at this point, right? The feel-good piece of, like, patting ourselves on the back. And it's not that the projects have not accomplished something, but it's also that we're not necessarily always telling the full story. And because the reality is that when we zoom out, we can see that just because we've been able to create joy in this place, and in particular, black joy, does not mean that there has not also been tremendous loss in this community, particularly black loss. And the reality is, as good as the stuff is that we're creating on our site, this thing here on the left is actually informing how people are showing up, what they're carrying with them when they come. And it's not like we are immune from the impacts of that. 
And so for me, starting to talk about what it means to hold all of that is a really important thing that we need to start to be able to do. And one of the biggest things that came around this was um, a couple of years ago when PG&E was finally ready to start talking about the long-term plans, um, they had a community meeting here. And that meeting was effectively a disaster. Like, imagine your worst community meeting and you have half of it. Um, and the reality is that like people are people were angry about what was happening in the neighborhood. Um, they were angry at the utility company because they were worried if the land was sold to a developer, they would just see luxury condos and displacement, which had unfortunately become the norm in this neighborhood. And they were also angry at the city because they were like, you know, this has been, there's been decades of disinvestment. Why have there not been more jobs and resources here? So you may want to talk about this one little project, but I have a whole host of things that I need to talk to you about. And I think that it's important to hold that anger because I think sometimes there's a tendency to just dismiss the anger that we see in places like this as the words of a few naysayers or agitators. They don't get the good that we're trying to do in this place. But even if there are some people who want to use these opportunities as platforms, that actually should not negate the validity of the anger that they're coming with, right? So when we talk about these community meetings and people showing up angry, it's in part, like I often say, like oftentimes behind every behavior, it's actually a super rational thought. So for many people, they're angry because somebody else has come to them before promising all of this good stuff and failing to deliver on it, right? They're angry because they're not sure if this time that you're showing up to present to them is the only time that they're going to be able to get their voices heard. And so they need to yell to be able to make sure you can hear them loudly enough. They're angry because um, there's a poet, Nair Wahid, who has this beautiful line that anger is often grief that has been silent for too long, right? And so oftentimes what they're showing to you is a whole history of pain from having experienced injustice after injustice or being ignored before. And so when you put it in that context, when I look at what happened in the community meeting, what I saw is that the residents were actually showing us a long trail of grief, right? Grief of not only living in conditions of spatial injustice for decades, but also from having many promises that maybe might have been met to a certain degree, but were shallow promises, and they were insufficiently met, and they had to live with that, right? And so I often think about how do we talk about that, that anger that we see in those places as like not an understanding that we didn't have the best of intentions when we showed up, but that our good intentions were not, not enough if we're building on a foundation of broken promises and squelched dreams. And so what does it mean to hold the complete story of what we're working within? And there's a great quote by the Chicago activist Charlene Carruthers who says that when we tell incomplete stories of who we are and where we've been, we have incomplete solutions. So for me, holding all of this is how do we understand that complete story that we are trying to do these projects within, right? And so in the context of that old power plant site, it's not just a story of that site, it's a story of the larger neighborhood that is impacting everything about what people's dreams and hopes are around that particular site, right? So I realize that this might seem really hard to hold and even a bummer like crap, like I already thought we were trying to hold this thing and now you're saying I need to hold this? And I want to say that I don't actually think this is a no-win situation and I recognize that we may feel like, oh, but I only touched this little bit and I want to talk about what it would mean for us to hold that larger piece, because I actually think it is possible, or at least I'm noodling and experimenting with that. And some of it, I think, actually rests with holding things that we don't normally think of as part of the projects that we do. And that has to deal, has to deal with, like, how are we showing up? in these projects. And I think oftentimes when we go in to do this work, we want to put on our um, professional hat. Like I'm coming in as an architect, or I'm coming in as an organizer, or as a city official. And while I have things to talk about related to that, um, I want to say that I think the most important thing that we need to talk about is how are we showing up as individual people? Because that has a huge role 
in what decisions we make, what assumptions we're coming in with, how are people actually able to relate to us. And so to that, there's often a, um, a kind of thing that I speak to about how do we hold that. Um, and so for me, I feel in this room, we might have a couple different constituencies that are showing up in different ways. And so I wanna to speak to that first. So for those of us in the room who might have started with less, either because of the color of our skin, the wealth of our parents, the place of our birth, or anything that doesn't fit within the dominant identity, I want you to know that I see you. And I think that showing up ne needs to be about us believing in our right to be in whatever room we're in, to believe that our pain is valid and that it's something that we can hold on to, um, and that we should feel safe, when we feel safe to do so, actually showing our pain. Because I think the more that we can be vulnerable, that that is actually not something that is putting us up to be hit upon, but it's actually a tremendously courageous act, right? And when somebody is vulnerable, it gives other people the permission to do so. For those of us in the room who have a little bit of power and privilege, um, which might include some people from the previous group, um, I want you to know that I see you too. I recognize that we want to do good in the world and I honor that you wanna make that part of your story. But I think we also have to recognize that unless we come to terms with our guilt, shame, and complicity that is often interwoven into the things we wanna do, that we actually can't make the change that we wanna make, right? And I, I call out those things in particular because they're often things that we run away from because they're scary and they're yucky and they don't feel good to talk about. But those are also forms of pain and we have our own healing to do. Sometimes there's a desire to project that onto some of these communities, but I think if we hold that everybody has some healing and that we're only gonna move forward if we all grab that by the horns, that's the only way that we can make change. And so in thinking about that, I often say that there is a difference between doing good, which is about how we show up, and doing right, which is about how we hold ourselves accountable. And so starting to talk about holding some of this stuff that is uncomfortable and yucky and feels like, oh, that's just emotions, I don't wanna deal with that. That's about what we need to do to be able to shift to being in the doing right camp. Because the doing right camp means we are holding all of that and thinking about it in a day-to-day -day basis. And doing right means that we start to ask critical questions of ourselves and our, um, and our institutions and also our communities it also means that we don't just celebrate all the things that are good, but you also celebrate the things that have been bad and that haven't worked. Because that's being able to interrogate that and ask questions about that is part of how we actually get it to be in the right space. So I'm gonna talk about um, what it means to move that into actual practice. Um, and for me, that's a lot about how do we then reframe the professional piece. So, I'm gonna, I wouldn't present these as solutions. They're just kind of where my head is at. So think of it as a work in progress. Um, and it's a little bit about shifting how we talk about certain things. The first thing is this idea of shifting from unintentional actors to intentional accomplices. So I talk to a lot of designers, but I'll talk to other people who participate in a process of doing a project. And it, it's amazing how many people think, I actually don't have any power in this whole thing. Right, uh, somebody has hired me or my boss has told me I need to do this thing or there's somebody else who's pulling the levers. I'm just trying to get something good done and I'm doing the best that I can, which is good. But the reality is that if anyone is paying us or has given us some power to make a decision that impacts something else, then we have power. And so what I wanna challenge you to do is to think about how are you actually using that power? It may seem really small in comparison to whoever is above you, but it's something, right? And it's often more than the people who are the recipients of whatever service you're actually delivering. And so shifting to thinking about how do we make intentional choices around that, I think it's super important. And then I use the word accomplice very deliberately. So these days there's a lot of conversation about how to be an ally. And while I do think there are times where being an ally is exactly the right thing you should do, the reality is ally is sort of saying, 
I totally support your cause. Like, I'm there with you. I believe what you're trying to do is right. And I see the condition. I'm trying to help you. But I'm not moving from my spot. I'm staying within the relative comfort of my privileged position, right? And so being an accomplice means I'm willing to risk some skin in the game to support that fight that you're doing. So what does that look like in practice? I want to use a project that I actually worked on um, over a decade ago, pretty early on in my career, but it, I, I think it kind of speaks to this. So it was actually addressing day laborers, so people who look for day's work for day's wages. We see them in cities across the country. I haven't been in Chattanooga long, but I imagine if I asked you where can I go to hire somebody to help me with my house, you'd be able to tell me. So there are day labor sites in cities all across the US. And at the time that we were doing this project, which was like 2006, 2007, estimates were that there were over 100,000 men and women who looked for day labor work each day in the US. And the reality is that day labor work is actually not new. Um, in this country, in earlier times, it was the dock workers. And it was always how immigrants came and entered into the workforce. It's just within the last half century that we've sort of aligned it with mostly Latino men. The majority of the sites that existed were actually informal sites. So street corners, Home Depot parking lots, gas stations, et cetera. And as architects, um, we became really interested because it seemed that at these sites, there was a lack of things that seemed like they would accord to basic human rights. So there was no shelter, there were often no toilets, or no water, no place to sit. And we thought, oh, as architects, this is something we could actually address. Um, we also had to recognize that from a population standpoint, it was never like a day laborer was going to come into our offices and say, hey, I'm having that problem at the corner. Can I hire you? Right? So we had to actually go out to them. And that kind of speaks to one of the things that has become a hallmark of the work that I do. I believe that I serve two clients, the people who pay me and the people who have to live with what I've created. And they're not necessarily one and the same, but I have the responsibility to make sure that I'm understanding the needs and desires of both clients. Um, so in this case, spent a lot of time in street corners across the US talking to the workers. Um, and the things that we heard actually informed the design. So the idea was this kit, of car kit of parts model that could be deployed in different configurations depending on the site. So this particular one was for one located in LA. Um, and it was actually going to be a large one because it was serving 200 workers. So there's a lot of pieces of the design that we necessarily go into, but one thing was um, we heard from the workers that no matter how organized the site was, having visual access to see each and every hiring transaction was important to building trust among the workers. So we sort of designed it that it could operate that way and have seating that could pull out so it could serve more people. We also understood that oftentimes there was a need for either office or um, this one we were sort of playing with the idea of almost having a food truck embedded into it and you could use the income from that to help maintain the station. And then finally, one of the things we heard in talking to a lot of the workers as well as organizations that would serve that community is that peak hiring time was often between 6 to 9 a.m., but a lot of workers would hang around, um, partly because that was their community, partly they were hoping somebody would come late to hire them. And so what immigration rights groups had started to do was to actually provide various trainings and services like teaching English during those times. So the idea of this being able to turn into a classroom or even a meeting space for workers was one of the things that came out from our conversations. So in the grand scheme of things, this all seems like a great, like really exciting, inspirational project. But for me, the things that start to speak to, I mean, and all of that was about intention. But the kind of accomplice piece kind of came from some other pieces. So this is that same site. And one of the things around the time that we were doing this was right about when the last immigration bill was before Congress. And if you don't remember, there was actually a lot of marches um, in cities across the country. And so when we talked to immigration rights groups, one of the things that they noted, and which they believe led to part of the failure of that bill, is that when you looked at who was marching in the street, you often saw a sea of brown faces. And so to be frank, if a politician's thinking, who's actually going to come and show up and vote for me come election day, it wasn't the people who were in the streets. And so their talk about how do we shift the movement was, how do we get those people who politicians do believe votes to see this not as like, oh, I feel so bad for those people that they have to deal with those conditions to, that's my daughter's best friend's family. I'm going to go out and march alongside them. So 
a huge thing became like, how do we talk about community building efforts? So in this one, we were actually, this site was actually located adjacent to a mostly white middle-class residential development. And so we actually proposed, um, the site was huge. So we proposed actually building a community garden that could be jointly tended to by the workers and residents. And there was a lot of stuff built in to do these community building programs as part of it, to start to build those relationships so that the next time around, there would be everybody else who was also coming out into the street and marching. Another thing um, that we did is what you see on the right is from a poster series that we did as part of this project. So one of the things that we recognized when we were talking to people about this project, and this is like city officials, um, the average layperson, et cetera, is that the image of day laborers was sort of this faceless mass of Latino men. And the thing is that we saw part of our work is how do we get to people to see them as individuals, individuals with stories, and that their stories are just as valid as yours or mine. Um, and so we did this portrait series, um, and a lot of the things that they said sounded like you know, what we ascribe to be American values, that they came here for the, their families to give them a better opportunity. And so we exhibited this portrait series around and uh, I'm going to go back. Um, so this thing that you see is partly from the portrait series, but it's also a poster that we created for this big international award that we won. And what you see as quote bubbles are actually not um, quotes from the workers, but they're actually quotes from emails that I received over the course of doing this project. And it was everything from thank you for doing this for those men, they work so hard, to build it and we will burn it down with those nasty Mexicans. Um, that gem came after I was on the local news in Houston. So I don't you know, go around trying to get hate mail, but um, you know, for me, it was exactly what I should be doing, right? Because I had a platform to start to talk about, can we start thinking about these spaces? Can we start thinking about how they tie to dignity? Can we talk about the people who are impacted by us not looking at it? And so that was what I was able to do. And so I think it's how do we use our position and how do we risk, you know, give me hate mail all over the day, but how do we use that to be able to speak truth to power and speak things that need to be said to talk about things that no one else can talk about or the people who are most impacted do not have the platform to be able to talk about. And, you know, for this project it was that. For others it might be just telling the stories that I'm hearing from the residents that I'm talking to and actually bringing it forth to the power brokers and, you know, taking a stand to actually ask for certain things that perhaps a resident can't ask for, but I can be able to ask for within my position. So the other shift I wanted to talk about is shifting from this idea of dreaming big to dreaming whole. So I think that as, um, particularly as a designer, but I would say anyone who's shaped with creating spaces or being able to do things that impact communities, we're, we're kind of trained or we think about how what's the biggest best thing that we could possibly create and I think that's important but I would sort of say like we need to dream from a place of wholeness and that starts to go into this idea of how are we encompassing all the stories and how are we making sure that our projects aren't just these big ambitious things but they're things that actually start to talk about how are we celebrating every sto everybody's story and bringing the various things that impact their story to bear in our decisions of what we're doing as part of the project. So for this, I wanted to talk about a project I've been working on for the past five years, or four years, in um, Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and so it's uh, Friendship Court, which is right now a 150-unit Section 8 property, and we're going to be redeveloping it into a mixed-income property. Now, when you hear of Charlottesville, you likely think of the racist rallies and the killing of Heather Heyer in 2017. And it's true that that has actually left a pretty huge mark on greater Charlottesville community, of which they are still wrestling with. But the reality is that the wounds of injustice were seeded long before then. Um, we could talk about slavery, but we don't have all night, and I need to, plane to catch a plane. But if we go back even like 50 years, we can talk about the fact that urban renewal came to a city as small as Charlottesville, and it just ha so happened to raise the most vibrant African-American neighborhood, Vinegar Hill. Um, leading to not only the displacement of people and their stories, but also the creation of a couple concentrated zones of racial poverty like Friendship Court. So Friendship Court had existed for 40 years, had never actually received a significant remodel. Um, a lot of the apartments look like this. It was, of course, built on low-lying land, so basically the large green space, which is 
you know, the park, it basically becomes a lake every time it rains. And so in one hand, doing good here or sort of dreaming big would be like, how can we redevelop this and create new spaces, new, a new vibrant park for everybody to be able to, to live in? But that wouldn't necessarily be capturing the whole story. So one of the things I do in a lot of my projects at the beginning, um, because I issue community meetings, is I spend a lot of time actually talking with residents, either through interviews or listening sessions. And in this project, one of the things that we heard was um, these deep stories of pain. Um, people felt really stuck. And so if we were to talk about what doing good here was, it could easily mean building new housing to replace this. But if we were actually to talk about what doing right here might mean, it's actually like, how do we meaningfully address the wounds of racial injustice? One part of that was, how do we give power to those who've been most impacted by the harm to participate in determining what a healed future looks like? So in this case, very early on, we set up a project advisory committee made up of elected residents and community members. And they've basically been empowered as co-decision makers for the entire process. Like literally, there's been nothing that is too small about this project that they haven't had a hand in thinking about. We also set up a youth leadership program in partnership with UVA. They were able to help us secure a grant. And so we trained the youth in um, design and development things. We even brought some of them to UVA. Um, I should also note that UVA, University of Virginia, which is located, you know, barely a mile or two from this site, um, a lot of the residents had called this the plantation leading up to this. So a lot of those kids, or actually all those kids, not a single one of them had actually been to UVA before. Um, so even bringing them there and expanding their world to sort of see like this is a thing that is accessible to you was important. Two kids who graduated from that program are now part of the advisory committee. So we've been working with them for the last three years and that work has dramatically improved the quality of what we're coming up with. But when we talk about that quality, to go to the point of the idea that these residents feel stuck, it was not just looking at how do we build better housing, but how do we build the thing that actually enables, you know, you might have a new house, but you'll still feel stuck. So how do we build the things that enable you to feel unstuck? So what that has meant is actually looking at not only does mixed income mean that we are co-locating these different income levels, but like deliberately looking at how are we integrating them. So that's everything from, you're not gonna be able to know who's paying market rate, who's a regular um, sort of tax credit unit, and who's section eight. Like everybody gets access to the same things. It's looking at things like wealth creation um, and wealth building. And because a lot of the residents talk about like that is an aspiration of theirs to be able to own a home or do something that they can leave something to their kids. So we're not only looking at workforce development things, but we're also expanding what are the different programs that we can do to enable people to build wealth. Um, we're also recognizing because a lot of the kids here start off way, way, way behind kids living in the surrounding neighborhoods. We're also creating an early childhood center as part of the first phase that will be open to the residents here and also residents around with an idea of how do we give people a better start. All of those programs and projects and efforts have really come from the fact that we've been working hand in hand with this advisory committee. And so their words and their thoughts have influenced that broader project, that more holistic project of what we're doing here. So the final thing I wanted to share was to actually um, talk about what it could look like if all of these could come together. Um, and so for that, I wanted to share a project called Dick and Rick. Um, some of you may have heard of before. It's a little bit of story time, so I'm just gonna ask for your indulgence as I read it. Um, so once upon a time in the land of community-engaged design, there was a guy named Dick and a guy named Rick. And Dick and Rick wanted to use their design skills to help the community, but they weren't sure about how to go about doing that. Um, Dick is pretty sure he can think of a great project after seeing a story about a local community in the news. He hasn't spent much time in the area, but he really wants to help. Rick believes in the power of design too, and he wants to support and strengthen communities. He seeks out people in a nearby community to find out what's important to them. Dick and Rick use their, help to help, uh, use their design skills to help the community. Uh, Dick is pretty, uh, yep, I'm behind myself, okay. Uh, Dick and Rick approach the community to find out more. So Dick starts his site analysis. He doesn't talk to anyone. 
Rick finds out um, that there's a group of residents who are concerned about parks and he listens to their stories. He learns that Residents for Parks is a long-standing community group and has been working on improving the park for the past five years. And he asks if he can join their efforts. <laughs> Dick and Rick figure out how to start working with the community. Dick wants to ensure the community is engaged in a process, so he holds a public meeting to show off his design proposal. Rick understands that the residents are experts about their neighborhood, and so he begins working with the Residents for Parks group, and he asks them about the park and their community. Dick and Rick get feedback on their design ideas. Dick asks for input, but he's pretty confident in his proposal. He gets some mixed reviews on his ideas, but he still believes that his design can have the most impact. He has the best of intentions for the community. Rick spends a long, long, long time hearing from residents who don't all agree with each other. He designs a way for them to work together to help shape the proposal. Um, Dick and Rick manage their project budgets. Dick really doesn't think about the budget. There isn't much money, so he gets an unpaid intern to help with the work. I believe some people know that experience. Rick knows that the budget is tight, but he wants to make sure that the community's time is valued. So he knows that paying an intern will make it possible for someone from a less privileged background to move up in the design field. And so now, after many months, their parks are finally complete. Dick's park is pretty, but it fails to activate the space since no one is using it. Rick's park is pretty too, um, plus it's used by all the community members who helped to create it. And so now they learn about equity. Dick got his project published in a magazine who didn't seem to notice that there was no one using the park. The community was left with a new park, but it didn't respond to their needs or do anything to address the larger social issues impacting them. On the other hand, for Rick, community members got so excited about the design for the playground that the youth leadership group asked if he would help them design a stand for their farmer's market, which they built themselves. The community got two new projects and some new skills, and the design process increased civic engagement and leadership opportunities and gave community members the chance to implement their own solutions. The end. Um, so as some people who know me and know this project already, um, one of the not so secret subtitles of this is how not to be a dick. <laughs> so the reality is that Dick and Rick are the same person, right? And uh, if you just saw Dick's storyline, you would be like, oh, he's, he's doing good. He's really trying to help the community. And it is only by seeing it juxtaposed with Rick, you'd be like, oh, Dick, yeah. He's in that do-good camp, right? Which is all about how it makes you feel. Rick, on the other hand, is in the do-right camp, which is how do we actually make decisions that meaningfully impact people and that we can be held accountable for? And so we say how not to be a dick because the reality is we have all been dicks. At some point in some decision, we've done something that is dickish. And part of this is like not just what comes out at the end, but at every point in the process, how do we make decisions? How do we be more like Rick or Rickette, whatever you want to call it, um, more often, right? And if we have a dick moment, how do we be critical about that and talk about it and use that as a leverage point to do better the next time around and maybe even correct the decisions that we've made. Um, and so for me, I, I talk about all of this because I think it's important for us to hold that in this room, you're all touching so many communities. And so with all of that, the idea of how could we shift to do right instead of just doing good you know, to center the community's desires and actually start to be more intentional accomplices rather than just unintentional actors, to think about what it would mean to actually encompass the whole stories of both what is the context on the ground but what we're trying to achieve. That's actually how we move the needle on spatial justice. That's how we start to get there. And so it's not like, oh my God, there are you know, hundreds of years of injustice that we need to fight. I don't know how I deal with that. As you see in the example of Rick, it just starts with a little decision of how you're running a project, how you're engaging a community, how you're checking yourself in terms of how you show up. And so for me, that's where we need to talk about what it means to get at this point of how do we build a more just future. And it's really about with everything that we have, with all the power that exists within this room, with all the privilege that exists in this room, how do we actually think about, with every step, designing and living a more just present? So, thank you.